in on, on a midweek and have the whole band here. Amen. Telling you, you can't beat it. But anyhow, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I say it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We are so glad that everyone made it out. It's good to see my brother. I, he got out of toe. He's, he's a brave soul. He sticks that bad foot out there right in the aisle. But anyway, we'll know if somebody comes staggering down through there after a while. <laughs> but uh, he's not shouting. He's just talking about his foot being hurt. But anyhow, it's good to be here tonight, and we're expecting a great blessing from God. How many come to receive something from the Lord? How many come in this house to bless the name of the Lord? Amen. 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 Let's gather together in his name. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Master, that you privileged us again to be in your house. One more time to come before you, before your throne of grace. And Lord, just to forget everything else and to bless you. For Father, we know that you love us, and God, you already see our hearts cry. Father, you know all there is to know about us, and God, we're believing you and trusting you in everything. But God, just give us this time tonight that we might just worship you and that we might lift up the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to your glory, O oh God, and to your honor. And Father, I pray that you'd bless in the music Father, that you'd bless our pastor tonight, give him of your strength, undergird him with your truth, and Father, with your blessing. And let your word go out. For we know, Lord, it will not come back into you void, but it will accomplish that for which it was sent. Father, speak to hearts and lives this night, and we'll bless you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as we sing, what a mighty God we serve.
Father, we thank you for the words of each of these songs because they're so real to our hearts and bring joy to our life and put smiles on our faces. I looked around and saw just about every person in the building singing, and God, that's a beautiful sign. And I'm glad that we ended on what a friend we have in Jesus because no matter where we are or what we're doing and how dark or how bleak things are, we have a friend. And he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother and a friend that always will be there and always be there to supply the things that we need in our lives. So, God, we thank you for that tonight. And as we gather now with your people, we pray for your hand to be upon us, for your healing spirit to be in our midst, and that, God, you would touch every person in this building in one way or another. Physically and spiritually, we all need it. So, God, just have your way. As we bring forth a word, help us to listen, to receive it, and to make us stronger, wiser, and better for you. We do all this in faith, telling you that we sure love you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good to have all of you here tonight. Good to have Art back with us tonight. He's doing good. He's getting nothing but good reports, and that's what we want to keep on doing. So it's just good to have you. And good to have all the rest of you. Glad you're here. Hope you want to learn something, because I want to teach you something tonight. So if you want to learn, and I want to teach you, and God's in the middle of it, I bet you we'll come together. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start by... Uh, some testimonies. Uh, I've been told to either do it or, or leave. So, Mary, you want to be first or first? All right, you be first.
All right, Doris. Now turn around. And I've already heard, so make sure they all hear you. Y'all listen to this now. <laughs> I can't hear you. Kelly texted me today, was telling me all this, and you telling me to thank the church for your prayers, and you know, she was so excited, and I told Richard she texted me a second time, and she was really excited then, because I'm telling you, she messed it all up, and I don't have a clue uh, what she said the second time, I know part of it, but not, not right in the middle of it, where you get really fixing to get it, I don't know what happened, but anyway, she was excited, and she said, make sure you tell everybody thank you for your prayers, and all that you've done for her. And she, this was her second day at work today, and she was doing good. Amen. Amen. All right, anybody else? Brenda? Well, I'd just like to say also that I love the Lord, and the Lord has truly blessed me over the years, and I'm so thankful for my church family. And I, I'm so thankful for my son. He went through a lot this weekend. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else? That's right. We finally got a man to stand up. Not a man in this building has anything to be thankful for. If you don't have anything to be thankful for, men, turn and look at your wife. Oh, walk in the church, yeah. 
Well, be careful. I'm glad you can ride one too. Jimmy, yeah, I hear you. Amen. Amen. All right. Anyone else? Amen. Amen.
Nej. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 13. I appreciate each testimony. Everybody in here should testify. We've all got something to thank God for. So when you get a chance, jump up and take advantage of it. Psalms 13. I want to look at verse 3 to begin with. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now, let me read to you from the Living Bible and listen to the same words. He says, Answer me, O Lord my God. Give me light in my darkness, lest I die. Now, we're going to go to another psalm. We're going to look at Psalms 3 in a moment. But I want you to listen to what David says. He said, Lord, give me light in my darkness, lest I die. Now, if somebody came up to you and they said, I don't understand that verse. Would you explain it to me? How would you explain it? Give me light in my darkness, lest I die. Because the way you would explain it is the way you understand it. So what is he talking about? Now go to Psalms 3. And before we look at this psalm, let me explain to you what's going on. You know this because I've talked to you before about it. Absalom, David's son, has run his father out of the kingdom. Absalom wants to be king. And he has humiliated his father. And David, being the loving father he is, he left rather than confront Absalom and maybe have to kill him. So David runs as Absalom and everybody else looks at it. But he wasn't running from fear of Absalom. He was leaving in the love of his son. He hated his father and would do anything in the world to destroy him. He had stolen his kingdom from him. He had turned the people against David. It was just one thing after another. So David is in hiding. We think about that as being maybe one of the one of the darkest times in the King David's life, and probably the darkest, because we're talking about a son. And David doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to say. And he's trying to get some understanding from it, because God had promised him the kingdom. Now, when you go back and you look at the events and the circumstances that led up to this, Absalom was a, a wayward child. He was greatly loved by his father uh, to the point that David would not discipline Absalom. He, he was, whatever he wanted to do, he did it. He, today, we would call him a brat, a spoiled brat. Uh, in our language. But there's some tragic things that went on in that kingdom. Absalom's sister was 
raped by her half-brother. And David didn't do anything about it. Absalom later on takes matters into his own hand and he kills his half-brother. And David didn't do anything about it. So there were a lot of weaknesses in, in King David's life when it came to his family. And then we see how those weaknesses in the end turn against him. And he now is facing, again, the darkest time in his life and not knowing what to do. So he comes here in the third chapter and he begins to talk to the Lord and he records everything. As we look at this, I want you to think, what do you do in the dark times in your life? Now, every one of us can, can look back and we can, we can define what we think is the darkest moment that we've ever had in our life. If we live longer, we may very well have another experience that would be the darkest moment. But up to this point, what would, what would you call the darkest point in your life? What would it be? And then the, the next question is, when it was the darkest, what did you do? How did you handle it? And, and we're not talking about, you know, getting really religious now because we're in church. But truthfully, how did you handle it? What did you do? So we're going to see here what David does and I'm going to remind you that when you get in these dark moments in your life and we all have them and we're all going to have them there'll be more if we're going to live there's going to be more and when we get dark moments whatever it may be we've got to get a hold of God somehow we've got to get a hold of God whatever that takes we're going to have to do it in order for us to get a hold of God, we've got to believe the Word. You've got to believe the Word. You've got to be able to say God's Word is truth. And that, that not just be something that you're speaking, but let, in your heart, you've got to know it. God's Word is truth. It's life. And you've got to tell yourself that because if you, don't, if you don't say that, if you don't believe that, you can never get in touch with God. Never. Because it will always be doubt whenever you try to pray. And then when the answer doesn't come, more doubt's going to come. And when it doesn't come in the way that you want it to, more doubt's going to come. So we have to be able to believe that God's word is truth. And no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, God's word is truth. No matter what somebody tells you, God's word is truth. You keep going over and over and over in your mind. God's word is truth. God's word is truth. It's life. Now, God's word says that he helps us. He's always there, and he helps us. That no matter what we go through, God helps us. That's why he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Because he'll always be there. And he'll always be offering his help to us. I, I thought about what Mona said, and, and she's telling the truth. Things happen in her life, and she gets afraid. We've talked about a lot of them. And, and she doesn't know what to do. And then she remembers what God's done in the past. And she does the best she can to trust God. I know she loves the Lord. But when the devil brings things in our, in our lives, it's hard because we're human beings. But what, what you do once they come is what's going to determine the outcome. And that's why Mona is still in church today, still talking about a God that loves her. It's because she knows God and she loves him. 
these, these dark times, we have to look at them as growing times in our lives. We would like to have everything work good for us and be easy and comfortable. But that's never going to happen until we get to heaven because there is an adversary that literally hates us. And he's going to do everything in his power to bring darkness into our life. Now, David says, oh, Lord, so many are against me. So many seek to harm me. I have so many enemies. So many say that God will never help me. Four times, so many. David was, everything about him was so dark that all he saw was the ones that were against him. And you know, I, I, I've heard it many times. I know you have too. People in the church tell you that nobody loves me, nobody cares. So-and-so said something ugly about me. So-and-so did me wrong. And we focus on that one or that two or that three, forgetting the four or five and six that looked at us and said, I love you. Forgetting the ones that brought us a meal or came to us in our time of sorrow. Forgetting the ones that sent us a card that cheered us up. We don't see that because we're seeing the dark. We want to talk about the dark. And David's doing that here. So many, he says, are against me. So many are trying to harm me. So many, so many, so many. And we got to realize that there are a lot more that love us than those that hate us. I mean, we, we have to believe that. There are more people trying to help us than trying to destroy us. And we have to focus, but we can't do that when we're in a dark area because we've allowed the darkness to consume us so we can't see the other. And we have to somehow get that darkness away from us so that we can do it. So he goes to prayer. He says, but Lord... Now, listen again as he says, Oh, Lord, so many are against me. So many seek to harm me. I have so many enemies. So many say that God will never help me. But, Lord, you are. See, in, in this darkness that David's in, he's had enough of it. And you will never get rid of the darkness in your life until you've had enough of it. You got to get to that point. So David said so many, all these things, and he says, but Lord, you are my shield, my glory, and my only hope. He's tried everything. That's what Mary was saying, the woman with the issue of blood. She had tried everything, used up all of her money, done everything she knew to do, and it still didn't help because she got fed up with it in a way she never had before. And she realized that Jesus, he is my only hope. He's not my hope. He's my only hope. See, we have to get to that point. We have faith and hope in this and that and the other. But when it fails and it doesn't work time and time again, somewhere along the way, we have to stop and say, wait, I, I've had it. I'm pushing all this aside. God, you're my only hope. We're going to sink or swim. You're it. That's exactly what he did here. You're my only hope. You alone can lift my head now bowed in shame. You alone, God, can give me courage. You alone, God, can make me get my head up where I've had my head bowed in shame. Shameful for what I've done. And I, I, I don't know what to do. I can't undo it. I'm, I'm constantly reminded. I've got enemies coming after me. I've got people trying to destroy me. And I don't, I don't know what to do. I've, I've hid long enough. I'm, I've run from Absalom long enough. I've, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and, and I'm not much of a witness for you. I, and I don't know. He finally just said, Danny, just shut up. But Lord, you're my only hope. And I know that you hear my prayers. And I know you're going to answer my prayers. And I know it's going to come in the right time, and the way you're going to do it is going to be a good thing. 
So God, I just start over. And I'll hold that thought. What God wants us to do is, is we get in these situations, he wants us to pray. How much do you pray? How much do you ask God for the same thing? Much here can be how many times. And when we, when, we, when we are having a dark situation in our life, and we finally get to the point where we say, God is my only hope, and we turn to God, I mean, we've asked every friend we have, what, what should I do? What did you do in this situation? What should I do? Do you think I ought to try this doctor? Do you think I ought to do this medicine? Do you think I ought to go there? I got a friend of mine that every time he and I talk, and, and he says, well, how you doing? And I say, well, I've got a headache. I got some pills. He's constantly telling me that. And every time he's ever told me that, I said, no, I don't want your pills. But his idea is I give you a pill and you can get better. He's never one time offered to pray for me. Now, that's bad, isn't it? But how often do we do that? Oops. Oops. <laughs> it may not be a pill. But how many times do we stop to pray with somebody? Or we encourage them to go to this doctor or that doctor, doctor, but we don't pray with them. We don't talk to them about the Lord. David just got to that point. He said, listen, I've had enough. I, I, I'm not going to ask anybody else because no matter what I've asked and no matter who I've asked, I'm still in the worst shape I've ever been in. So now I'm going to turn to the Lord. And he said, but God, I know that you're the only hope I have, and I'm turning to you. So we've got to pray. But how many times do you pray? And here's the thing. If you, if you want to talk to somebody on the telephone, you call them, don't you? If they don't answer, what do you do? You leave a message, right? If their message box is full, what do you do? You call them back. If they don't answer, what do you do? You text them. No, you call them back. And you call them back, and you call them back, and you call them back until you finally get them one way or the other. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. Call on him. Go somewhere in the Bible and show, where, show me where it says, call on me one time, and I'll call you back. He tells us, just keep call on me. Call on me. Call on me. Call on me. And that's what God wants us to do. His line is never busy. It's just that God has to get us in a certain point in our life, in our, in our thoughts, in our process, and in our hearts for him to bring forth the answer that we need. David had gone through his whole process, and he's been caught, caught on the Lord, and finally he says, Lord, you're my only hope. When he got that serious with it, God began to answer. David was in a dark spot. But I'm going to tell you something. God will bring light to every dark spot you have in your life. He'll bring light. He is light. And he'll bring himself in there and allow you to be able to see. Now, once you believe God's word and you begin to claim it as God's word, then you need to relax. You think about it. We're always, we're trying to fix things, just constantly trying to fix. And we we're working and we're working and we're working and, and we go here and we go there and we do this and we do that and we say this and we say that and we just, it's constantly we're working. And finally we get to the point where we realize, I need God. I say, God, you're my only hope. And when we say that, God then says, all right, put your hands down. And the hardest thing in the world for us to do is to put our hands down. For we men... That may be one of the hardest things we'll ever do is to do nothing. When you've had your hand on your children or your life and you've met every need they've ever had, when it comes a time that you leave or they leave and get married, what do you do? Well, we men pray, but the women, they become meddling old hags. 
they go over to, the, to their house and they take care of everything and tell them what they need to do and how they need to do it and all that kind of mess. So we men are praying. But no, we become meddlers, don't we? We try to fix their life even after they're gone because we think we know. No, it's just that we love them. But God says, no, there comes a time when you say, you turn it over to me, I want you to relax. Just get your hand still. Just relax. And when we relax, we're saying, God, I, I know you're in control, and I'm going to let go. But we have to tell the truth. God, when I start meddling, tell me, because I still have this desire to want to do it. So, God, you help me. And we have those big things in our lives, those big problems. Fear comes with them. But you've got to define big. What is big to me may be a thorn, you nothing to you. See, we all handle things differently. So, in our own lives, when something big comes, however we define big, it brings real fear in our life. And then we have to figure out what to do with that fear. And that fear will consume us and cause us to say and to think and to do things we should never do. That's how we keep getting in trouble with God. It's just over and over and over and over. We keep doing this thing and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse because we're trying to fix it and because all this stuff's going on and we don't know what to do. So we get all messed up. And then somehow we got to stop and say, God, I need you because I can't sleep. I don't have any peace. I don't know what to do. God, you're my only hope. And we turn to him. And God says, well, finally. Thank goodness I've been waiting on you. I've had the answer all this time, but you wouldn't ask me, so I didn't give it to you. I'll let you go ahead and handle it yourself, and look what you got. You see? So we begin to trust God in a special way. David was having a horrible situation. It's his son. He has humiliated David. He knows that Absalom was a sinner. I mean, which, which part of this problem hurt David the worst? He, di he didn't know what he was going to do. So he finally just said, God, you know the answer to this because you look in the future. I, d I don't want to do anything to hurt my son, but something's got to be done. And I don't know what to do. So I'm going to trust you. I'm going to start thanking you for the answer, even, even though I don't know what it is. I don't even know when it's coming. But I'm going to start thanking you because I trust you. And God, I'm going to take my hands off of it. I'm going to do the best I can to stay out of your way. And you just do what needs to be done in all this because David didn't have any peace. And when we start getting those bad situations, the, the, one of the biggest things we lose is our peace. We, we, it's just not there. And Isaiah, he said, peace is our birthright. What do you think about that? To a Christian, peace is our birthright from God. Guaranteed. It's the fruit of all of God's promises. The fruit that comes from a promise of God. Peace. And we don't have peace. It's not our fault. It's not, it's, it's not God's fault. It's ours. Because we've done it the wrong way. After we have relaxed, then we have to believe that God is going to take this situation and he's going to deliver us from it. Whatever it is, whatever the dark situation there is in your life, you've got to believe God's going to deliver you. You won't know how, but you've got to believe that God is going to deliver you. Not yourself. But God is going to deliver you. You got to claim it. You got to start rejoicing. You got to start thinking before it ever happens. You've got to be able to praise God and thank Him. And when you get that attitude, then it'll all make a difference. Now, salvation, I'm gonna, I'm, I want you to think about this. I'm, salvation is God's promise, right? I wrote that down, and then all of a sudden, it hit me. What, what is salvation? It's 
Salvation is God's promise to us. And the first thing that if you're honest, because I did it, the first thing you think of is forgiving us, forgiving us of our sins. Salvation is God's promise. That's exactly what I, I wrote down, and, and that was my thought. And then God said, no. See, we're talking about dark things in our lives. And we're talking about us messing them up. And then turning to God and God bringing light into our darkness. So he said, salvation here is not forgiving me of my of sins, but God has promised us salvation from any dark thing that comes in our life. He will save us from it. He will deliver us. He will bring light into our darkness and make us well and make us whole. That's his promise. So salvation, as far as our soul, he certainly promises, but salvation from these things that happen to us, he will deliver us from darkness. God has promised us victory, and God can't lie. Yeah, I'm going I'm to leave you with a question. When we think about the fact that God wants to deliver us from our darkness, again, what do you think about? In light of what I've said here, what do you think about? And the answer is the trials and tribulations that come in our lives. But what if there's another darkness that is far greater than any trial or tribulation we'll ever face in our life. What if there's another one? What would it be? Take that home with you. We'll look at it next week. And there is one far greater. I'll tell you that's not a trick question. Okay, our youth are here. They're going to come up and we're going to come up and anoint them and pray for them. They're leaving Friday to go on their trip. And we want to pray for safe travel. We want to pray for everything they need to have a good time and enjoy the Lord and come back different boys and girls. Still boys and still girls. I don't mean that. I meant but different. Oh, my goodness. I don't see any men. All right, I want, um, I want some of you to come up and gather around them and let's pray together for them. I'd need the tree for that. All right. This is a good group. No, I'm just thinking. I got some great memories in my life for what you guys are fixing to do. I've done it many a time. I wish I was doing it this time. Chris gets a chance to do something to ever teach you of the gospel. Love to do, and that's teach y'all Jesus Christ.
perhaps make a difference in your life or something down the road. And I encourage you to have fun. When it comes time to learn, I encourage you to give Chris your attention. I always made that deal with my youth. I, I would have fun with them and give them their time, but when it was my time, you give me my time, and they always did. So listen to the word. Let the word move. Let the word change you. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Because you don't know what's out in your future. God does. You just got to get ready for it. This church is going to be praying for you while you're gone. And as your pastor, I'll start to be praying for you. <clears throat> Father, <clears throat> we thank you for our young people. They're a great group of kids because they love you. God, I know they don't understand all of that. We don't. We have a lot more years than they do. But God, this can be a trip where they learn some things they didn't know. And I pray that <clears throat> you'll go with them every step of the way. God, protect them as they travel. Protect them every time they stop. And keep them safe until they get there and then be with them throughout the camp. Then bring them back home safe. Let them have a good time with one another, but God, let them have a great time with you. And I pray, God, that they'll be kind and courteous, respectful, because that's what they should be. And that they'll not bring any reproach upon the leaders, upon their parents, or upon this church. God, teach them. Teach them. Help them to want to learn. I pray, Father, for Chris and Steph that, Lord, you'll give them great wisdom. Help Chris to be bold with his teachings. Help him to be wiser than he is because that will be you taking over. I pray, God, for the moving of the Holy Spirit, and I do. Because I know that without the Spirit, it's nothing but a fun time. And I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will move in such a way that every leader will be changed. And every camper will be changed. And the Lord, when they come back here, we will see a difference. We'll actually see it. And that this youth group will grow and grow and grow. And that will happen when they grow in you. So keep them, Lord. Thank you for them. I thank you by faith for what you're going to do for this time with them. And we just pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.